attention humanitarian and development professionals. Are you looking to take your career to the next level? Then you've come to the right place. Humanitarian Global offers self-paced online courses designed specifically for you. With our comprehensive curriculum, you'll build your capacity in the most critical areas of humanitarian and development work. Our course offerings include monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning, water, sanitation and hygiene, disaster risk reduction and management, food security and nutrition and emergencies, procurement and supply chain management, human nutrition and dietetics, maternal, infant and young child nutrition. With Humanitarian Global, you'll have the opportunity to grow your skills and impact the lives of people in need. Visit our website to learn more about our courses and apply today. Hello everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, based on uh, where you're located uh, today. Um, we're beginning this uh, webinar promptly at 11 a.m. East African time, uh, Nairobi time. So I want to welcome everyone to this uh, free monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning webinar uh, hosted by Humanitarian Global. Uh, the topic for today is reporting for evaluation in projects. Um, our key speaker for the day is Winnie Moore. And uh, we do encourage you to do take part in this interesting conversation that's going to be happening today. Uh, before we begin, as always, I would like to mention a few house rules. Uh, house rule number one is uh, take advantage of the chat section. Let us know where you're joining from. Let us know uh, if you're interested in any of the courses, our team will be able to reach out to you. Uh, also feel free to share with us uh, your contact details. Remember when you share with us uh, any information, it only goes to a humanitarian global who's hosting this webinar. It's not public information. So feel free, do not shy away, share with us your contact details, any questions you may have in regards uh, to the courses that we do offer in regards to the programs that we do offer also any questions regarding uh, who humanitarian global is to share with us and we will be able to respond to you um, house rule number two is take advantage of the q and a section uh, today's topic is as i've said uh, reporting for evaluations in projects and this is a very important topic, especially in the field of meal and M&E. Uh, if you have any questions while our expert for the day, Winnie Moya is making her presentation, do direct your questions to the Q&A section and after her presentation, we'll be able to address uh, those questions. House rule number three is uh, at the very end of uh, our experts uh, presentation, we always do ask for some participants to come on live and ask questions. So during this time, we will ask our participants to raise their hand for those of you who are interested in uh, doing so, and we'll be able to allow you to come on board and ask your question. So for now, uh, if you have anything, any comment, kindly do put it in the chat section. Uh, if you raise your hand right now, uh, uh, we might not be able to pick it up. Uh, with that said, uh, we can begin today's program. So I will start with a salutation. As you know, here at Humanitarian Global, we have a very big team. And I just want to welcome uh, those who are currently in this webinar just to say hello. I'll start with I'll myself. Start with myself. My name is uh, Diana. I am the training coordinator here at Humanitarian Global. Uh, and I believe I've been able to interact with a few participants here and there uh, through these kind of webinars that we do host. With us, we also do have Anthony. Anthony, you can say hello to the team and just uh, introduce yourself. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you so much, Diana. And uh, hello to our participants. Uh, just another day to connect and uh, get to learn more when it comes to meal. My name is Anthony Mukuhi from the academic support team at Humanitarian Global. So at any time that you have a challenge when it comes to our audio, our connection, sharing of the screen, or uh, any other technical issue, uh, feel free to chat me and I'll be there to assist you. So thank you once again. And uh, remember to share the link uh, with your colleagues, with your friends, so that they can also join and uh, get to learn and uh, uh, you know get to enjoy the session as well. So thank you so much and uh, over to you, Diana. Thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, we also do have Brian with us. Uh, Brian, you can say hello to the team. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm in charge of marketing. Um, I look forward to a resourceful event. Thank you, Dan. 
Thank you so much, uh, Brian. Uh, I'll bring on board Winnie just to say hello, although she will come back later on uh, to make her presentation on today's topic. Winnie. Hi, Dana. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, my name is Winnie Mwa, and I'm the meal expert for today. I'll be taking you through the session. So looking forward to interact uh, with you more. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Winnie. And uh, for those of us joining us for the first time, I'm sure you're very curious. You want to know more about who Humanitarian Global is. So uh, basically, Humanitarian Global is uh, primarily a training institution, although we do uh, offer organizational uh, solutions as well as community development and offer humanitarian resources. And uh, this is done through develop, uh, sorry, this is done through uh this is done through providing a platform uh, that supports learning and interactions to all humanitarian professionals. We are able to support professional humani uh, professionals in the humanitarian and development uh, fields and this is done through also through our vision mission and goal and through this we've been able to actually establish collaborative relationships uh, with not only organizations but humanitarian professionals across the globe we do have a reach of 50 plus countries and as much as uh, most of these countries are within africa uh, we do have a reach as well in the in europe the americas uh, asia uh, as well as um, Australia. So we do have a reach across the globe, having uh, trained or having interacted with 500,000 plus professionals. And uh, part of our model here is being able to listen to what our participants what what our participants uh, require and we're able to then uh, meet their needs so with that is why we've been able to come up with a course a short course which is something that will be covered today and today's uh, topic it will be a short sort of a short training only an hour long we might not have time for to cover everything today and that is why we've been able to develop a short course called proposal and report writing training uh, this starts in july in july and uh it's going to be an online interactive uh course it's not going to be uh self-paced it's not going to be using the student portal it's going to be interacting one-on-one -on -one, uh with our trainers and some of the things you're going to be able to uh do is just get an understanding of uh guidelines understanding of what proposal and report development is as well as uh things such as pitch decks, as well as funding and donors requirements for these proposal writings. You're going to be able to look at um, uh, the designing, the developing, the strategies behind proposal and report writing. Uh, you're going to look at uh, project management as well and risk management under these uh, topics. Something else you'll be able to follow through is a uh, proposal and report writing best practices. So you'll be able to have a look at a few case studies here and there. You'll be able to see tips on successful uh, proposal report writing. This uh, is actually a very important Important field, as I have mentioned, in the M&E fields, in the mill fields, and um, it's actually really correlated to that. So anyone who's looking to transition or anyone who works within these fields, uh, uh, it's very important for you to be able to understand uh, more on proposal and report writing. So this is our online course. If you're interested in it, I have shared the link on um on the chat for this webinar so you simply come to the web page and click on apply now if you have any other questions in regards to this kindly do share your contacts with us and our team will be able to reach out to you and shed more light on this um, with that, I want to welcome our expert for the day. As I've mentioned several times at this point, uh, the topic is reporting for evaluations in projects. So without further ado, I uh, do welcome Winnie, our meal expert for the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, for that. So let me just um, burn my video, at least you can see me and say, you at least met me for this session. Uh, but allow me to put off my video during the presentation. 
Um, maybe also I can do a little bit of a detailed introduction now. I, I can say we have participants from different countries that uh, I've also worked in, particularly the Horn of Africa. I've worked in South Sudan, Somalia, um, Kenya, and Zambia, uh, as well as in the Middle East, Syria, Yemen, Lithuania, Haiti, quite a number of countries. So I've been doing um, monitoring and evaluation for over 10 years now. And I have been doing supporting both humanitarian and development projects. So I, I do understand practically how to undertake this um, exercise. So what I'll go take you through today is really the practical approach that I use uh, even currently as an external consultant. So I hope it will be clear and easily digestible. But of course, as Diana said, put in your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the session. Thank you. Okay, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Maybe Diana can just confirm if they see from your end and then we can continue. Uh, yes, we can. We can see the screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, so today we're talking about reporting in evaluations and the two main reports uh, that are actually core in evaluations. So that is an inception report and a final report and I'll go through them in detail. But before we begin, I think it's really important for us to know what is an evaluation before we even start the reporting, just to make sure that we are on the same page. So, of course, we understand um, monitoring, and then uh, this is an ongoing exercise that is done mostly when you're in the as the as a project implementer. So sometimes it's a project officer or assistant who is undertaking the monitoring or uh, and monitoring and evaluation officer. But when it comes to evaluation, this is different. And this is not, this is done only at certain points of the project. So the point of uh, doing an evaluation is one, to check whether the project has achieved what it's set out to do. We all understand that in projects, uh, when projects begin, so that is the first step of the project life cycle, we have a design phase or inception phase, whereby we put up uh, our objective uh, of the project or the goal, sometimes it's called the goal or the objective. And so at the end of the project, we need to check that this objective has been met and uh, that is done through an evaluation. Uh, you can also check the progress at the mid midline of the project. So that's like the halfway mark, especially for long, longer term projects. So projects which are over three years. Then secondly, we are also checking that we have, the project has realized the target results. So results are different from the objective in that we usually have uh, what we call like immediate results or intermediate results, which are also kind of part of outcomes. So, as the project progresses, you can be able to identify these results uh, a bit uh, easier or faster than the overall objective because you know it's incremental. As we continue to do activities, we can be able to see what is the result. Um, because I, if you see here, my slide does not have any word about impact. Uh, usually, impact is, is thrown around, and it the the real meaning of impact is actually long term. It's long-term effect and it's long-term after the project has ended. But what we usually can measure are immediate results of the project. Uh, so that means that as, as, a, as an effect, after, an after effect of doing your activities, what has happened in the community? What is the change that we can see attributable to your project activities, okay? And then we're also checking through an evaluation to validate uh, contextual factors that have facilitated uh, results. So context analysis is really key. When we are doing um, any project, it's really important to ensure that you have, uh, I want to use the word customize because it's, it's the best way to explain it in that you're not just taking projects like off the shelf and then you just you know throw it to a community. No, that's not how it happens. You can have, uh, completely similar project. Let me give an example. Uh, during the COVID-19 period, I think if some of you are working in NGOs, we all know that we were doing a lot of uh, wash projects. So that is water, sanitation, and hygiene. 
So we were emphasizing a lot on hand washing, hygiene promotion and awareness, but that did not look the same in every area. So for instance, you can be working in, um, in, in, in Uganda, let me say, for example, and you know the, there's the urban centers, there's the rural centers, there are refugee camps, so you can't use the same approach. You need to check um, that you know you, you contextualized how this uh, this project can work effectively. And the other thing about that is also on uh, relevance, which I'll touch on when we are talking about the evaluation reporting. So it's just to check that the project was actually relevant to the context. Okay. And then lastly, the point of also evaluation is to identify lessons learned and best practices. Um, I think this is straightforward. You know, the, the, the whole point is to also just decipher what has worked well, what hasn't worked well, what can we take forward? Um, how can we adapt it, you know, in other projects that probably are ongoing or even other projects that we are planning to do? So, you know, you, you, you need to be able to apply uh, a key factor in, in monitoring and evaluation that sometimes is forgotten is that you need to apply what you have gotten. So you do the report and then you ask, a, you ask the question, so what? So what happens after you've gotten all this feedback? The point is to adapt the next project to be better. Uh, if, if the project has not ended also, you can you know, put in the recommendations that you get and the findings to make it uh, much more impactful. At the end, again, as I said, impact is long-term. So when you put in those, when you put back those, um, findings, those lessons learned, those best practices and adapt them, you can be able to actually meet your goal and sometimes even, you know, surpass it and, and have a greater uh, uh, results, uh, target results and also long-term impact. So I hope you're clear. Now we can just be on the same page on, you know, what we are doing first of all. So we'll start out, uh, with the inception report and I've broken this down into you know, the, the, the W questions, you know, like when, where, who, why, where, so that it's, it's, it's really clear how it's done. Okay, so we start with when it's done. We've talked about the evaluation, when, when evaluations are done, we can do evaluations at the midterm of the project or at the, at the end of the project, that's the common times. Although we also sometimes term baseline assessments as forms of evaluation, um, but a little bit different than the others. So an inception report is done at the beginning of an evaluation after we have a preliminary meeting with the client um, and provision of desk review. So let me explain this a little bit. So what happens is uh, when an evaluation, uh, you plan for an evaluation at the beginning of the project. I think as I stated, when you're doing your project design, you need to think forward and think about the possibility or the need to be doing an evaluation. As I said, it depends on uh, it depends on the, the the time frame of the project. So you can do a midterm as well as a final evaluation, or you can do a final evaluation only. It also depends on the donor regulations. Some are strict that they, you need to do both of them. And then uh, again, now this now is also affected by the budget, the overall budget of the project. And you need now to ensure you also have specific budget for the evaluation. That budget will go to the external consultant. You can see the, uh, the, the second row is who does it, an external consultant. The external consultant is going to quote a price that will be feasible for him or her or the firm to be able to undertake that evaluation. So you need to think about that budget beforehand. Uh, sometimes if you've interacted with terms of reference before, you can see some are very clear and they stipulate the overall budget. Some just say provide a financial proposal and you have to have a backing towards it. In that financial proposal, someone usually breaks down what the costs are going into. And typically this uh, is a, uh, the main things in the budget are the consultancy, consultancy days. So that's normally like a daily rate uh, for the key consultant, um, key consultant. So that is either the team leader um, or you know, if it's a team of people 
you indicate them and their days. And then you also indicate any administrative costs that are needed. So maybe there would be some printing, um, some stationery, you need some office rent, uh, supplies, you need uh, also data collection um, costs. So this could be like focus group discussion facilitation. Uh, as we understand sometimes in this setup, especially in Africa, you know, when, when we are also um, seeking, uh, we are going into the community, we are taking some time from some people. So you need to also, um, you're not paying them. This needs to be very clear. You're not paying them for the feedback, but you're just, you know, making it a little bit easier so you can facilitate um, some water or uh, snack. Sometimes it's tea, whatever is locally available, but it's not costly, you know, it's just something for someone to, to just feel comfortable enough and at ease to give you the feedback. Right, so I've gone through th those as the main things that you need to think about when you're budgeting. So that's that needs to be very important. So after this, the, the, the person, um, the external consultant, applies for the evaluation, and at the onset, when you uh, when the award has been handed to this person, you have a preliminary meeting with them. Uh, remember, the only you didn't have any interaction prior. The only interaction was through the terms of reference, and sometimes the terms of reference is quite general. We have, um, we see instances where just like job descriptions, you know, you can use the same job description and sometimes it's not as defined as should be. So it's very important to have a preliminary meeting with the external consultant so that you understand, so that uh, the consultant understands what exactly are the objectives of this project. Uh, through this meeting, you can also, uh, you as the client, so the client here, can be an international NGO or a local NGO or the donor, whoever is instigating this evaluation. So that person can be clear on the objectives, can also be clear on what have really been the pain points in this project so that even as the consultant is undergoing, undertaking the exercise, they can be aware and make sure they're also um, include these things, these important details in their work. So let me give an example. For instance, um, uh, a project can be on, let's say food security, uh, food security and nutrition, okay? And you, and you, you want to undertake a midterm evaluation for this project and the, you know, the consultant bids for this and then you have your preliminary meeting. And during this meeting, the project manager, so let, let's, let's say I'm the project manager. So I will say, I will tell the consultant that, oh, you know, um, we have had a lot of problems with uh, delays of money, uh, cash transfers to the community. We've had a lot of diversions. We already know, we are aware, you know, you will see this in our annual reports. And we really need to have a way forward about this so that we can continue with this project effectively. So that's already a flag that you, you, you know that needs to be checked when you're doing the effectiveness. That means that now the external consultant can also do more concise targeting one when they're doing, when they're checking, I mean, when they're selecting who to give feedback. So it is in the, at the community level, yes, but they need to check who are these gatekeepers. So as external consultant, uh, for instance, I can decide to go to like the bank agencies, whoever is in charge of financing to also understand like even what are the contextual issues. Remember when I talked about that is to also understand how do things work really in the community? So who is in charge of what? and how are uh, funds, you know, if it's, ex especially if it's significant funds diversion, it means, you know, there's a number of people who are aware about this. So it's about targeting different people in the community and also being smart about it to ensure that you can get the feedback that you need. Uh, because the, as much as you can target these people, sometimes your data collection instruments or tools may not be effective to gather this feedback. But anyway, that's, that's just an example. So I've talked about the preliminary meeting and then the provision of desk review material. So this desk review material are the documents, the project documents. Project documents are things like the, the annual reports, uh, the, the proposal of the project. So how the project itself started, 
the monitoring and evaluation plan, that's the ME plan, the logical framework, result framework, uh, the risk matrix. There are so many things that can be included here, just depends on the project. Uh, any meeting, any minutes of the meetings that they've had or workshops, basically anything that has been taken down and or disseminated even like articles or publications that have been done, anything that is relevant to the project is something that should be provided to the consultant uh, because it serves as giving that background and contextual knowledge again of what has been done uh, when it was done, how effective it was, you know, through the reports, you can get to know how effectively it was done. Um, then uh, let me say also just here is that now at the beginning before, um, when you do the preliminary meeting, you won't have gotten these documents most of the time. Okay, it depends, let me say 50-50. In my experience, sometimes the client is very responsive and they may say, we are sending you the documents and then we can have a meeting uh, after you've gone through so that you also bring in questions from the documents that you may have. Uh, but sometimes you can have the meeting first and then the, the material. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, but at the end of the day, you will have time to go through this material. And then uh, now, you know, you, you make this inception report that we are talking about. So let me move to why it's important. So why it's important is that this inception report, inception report rather, guides the project team and the consultant on the evaluation plan. So it's basically like a map of how you're going to do the work, uh, the, the, the scope of work. So you do include the terms and, and of reference, but as I said, during this meeting, things will be defined a little bit better. Maybe the evaluation questions will also be much clearer. Uh, and so you'll understand really what is the true scope of work. You'll talk about also the data collection tools that are needed. As I said, once you get that information, both from the desk review and the preliminary meeting, you can know who needs to be targeted. So that is the who are the respondents that you need to target and the type of tools. So when we talk about tools, we are talking about like the key informant interviews, the focus group discussions, case studies, surveys, uh, observation. Yeah, I believe that's it. So surveys are also questionnaires. Yeah, or um, yeah, households, they can be also household surveys. And then you can decide also how you're going to undertake this. Sometimes this is also done remotely. Uh, you can do, you know, um, interviews virtually or you can have also data collectors who are on the ground, but yourself, you're in a different location. Um, and then also you include your work plan in this inception report. And just as a guide, as I said, it's like a mapping. So how is it uh, actually done? So we are talking about now writing the actual inception report. So you gather the important insights, as I've said, uh, through the preliminary meeting so that's really key that will build a lot on your inception report so that you, you're very focused in your approach. Um, this report is not supposed to be too lengthy. Okay, we'll talk about the length shortly. Uh, and so it needs to be concise. It needs to be really straight to the point of uh, what is being focused on and how it's going to be done. Um, and then you can also use the technical proposal that you submitted as the consultant as a rough draft to, to, to be edited. So this is an approach that I often use because you know once when you're doing your technical proposal, you have really thought through the terms of reference, like what has been advertised and you really, especially when it's a detailed terms of reference, it's really helpful to you for you to internalize as a consultant how to undertake this evaluation. So you can start that as a, as a basis and then build on that through the desk review. Uh, and then lastly, an, another key point that can also help you is, is um, you can be able to now refine these tools uh, and include also a sampling technique that you, you want to use. So there are various sampling techniques. Of course, now this will be, you have to use a practical one that, you know, one that is uh, usable. 
So we have like probability sampling and non-probability sampling. And those are the two key types of sampling. In each, there are various, uh, I won't go through that in detail, but let me just give an example of uh, one commonly used one, especially for qualitative data or research, we use purposive sampling. So purposive sampling is, uh, it's also sometimes referred to as judgmental uh, sampling, whereby you select the informants who have, who are uh, quote unquote information rich. That means that they, they know, they know their stuff. <laughs> Let me just put it like that. So they, they, they know, you know, whether it's like the project manager, that person is informed, he knows what is in the project, right? And he's the most, uh, he's the best person to actually approach when you need information about the project, correct? So uh, you, you can use that approach um, to, to, to select these people. Even the early example that I gave, when you, you've already heard of challenges of diversion of cash, you use purposive uh, sampling because you'll go to, let's say like the elder community elder, you'll go to a woman leader, you know, people who are also influential in the community so that you can really get to know what's, um, what exactly has been happening. It would not be wise to use just a random approach when you already know that, uh, you, you don't know, you, you go to a community and just select anyone, you might miss to get a lot of uh, key information. Okay, um, so I think that's clear on how to do it. So you just gather all those insights and then you put it in a, in a systematic way. We'll talk about the, the way just shortly. So um, lastly, there is on length. So the inception report is not a lengthy report. It's actually very concise. It should be about 10 to 15 pages at most, actually at most. It can be sometimes even shorter than that. Uh, I've had inception reports which are like eight pages, as I said, it's straight to the point, it's very concise. Um, and it also depends on the complexity of the project. So sometimes we have projects that are, uh, one, they are consortiums, that means there are many partners. Two, they could be you know, multi-year projects that have really been doing a lot of activities um, that could be, you know, that, that could be a lot. Uh, because in this inception report, I think what I, I forgot to mention is also what you include is something on how far the project has come. So we've we've touched on my earlier slide there. The first row, we talked about uh, the provision of the desk review material and I talked about annual reports. So those annual reports, you need to also just have like a, a summary of what has been done so far. So you see, if you, you have a project which has a lot of activities, they've had a lot of outputs, that means that you know you you when you're presenting this, it might be quite a lot uh, of uh, of pages, maybe two or three, just in the findings. Uh, whereas normally it's like one page, sometimes even half a page for some smaller projects. Okay, but it's also about being smart about how to present this information. You don't need to elongate it. Um, this this information will be much more. It will serve you more in the final report that will go through as well. Okay, um, and uh, and again, you know, the inception report is something that you will provide to the client, and they will give feedback on. So sometimes they may give feedback that they say you need to increase the level of detail. Maybe you need to include something like the the results framework. They need to see the logical framework. So you need to also just um, keep that in mind. That as much as you may have that page limit, it may also be guided by the client. Okay, and then now lastly on the structure, uh, you'll see it's very similar to normal reports or even the final report that we'll go through. We have the title page and then the executive summary. The executive summary here is going to be very short or it can be long depending on a complex project. But let me say, normally most of the time this is a short executive summary, sometimes called abstract, which is, uh, even half a page, uh, like 50 words, is sufficient. And you're just summarizing the content of the inception report. So you just write, you know, what exactly is the evaluation plan and, uh, you know, the tools that are going to be used and, um, and maybe just a short 
short uh, two or three lines on the evaluation questions to be focused on with the objective. Okay, then we have the table of contents and then we have an introduction of background that I was talking about um, just shortly on a summary of what has been done. In the introduction, you, you talk about two things. You talk about the evaluation objectives. Remember, there's the project objectives, which are the overall objectives, but you also have evaluation objectives that are key only for the, for the evaluation. So those evaluation objectives are broken into sometimes evaluation questions, uh, but sometimes it can be just left as evaluation objectives uh, where you can have things like you want to see the impact, uh, not impact, rather, uh, the effectiveness of the activities that have been done. We want to see how far long that uh, the project has gone into meeting its outcomes. Um, maybe they want to see how efficient the resources have been, uh, either financial or human resources. Those are examples of objective evaluation objectives so that needs to be there then we talk about the proposal method a uh, proposed methodology and that is where i was talking about the data collection tools and sampling then we talk about the risk matrix so this is very important uh, because we need to have foresight into what could go wrong um, potentially so risks are things like uh, you know the potential of maybe not being able to collect the data in some areas? As we all understand, you know there are areas. Um, climate change is, is really influencing a lot of our day-to-day -day activities. So there are chances that sometimes you go into the field, um, and some some of these are you can predict them seasonally. You know that there are times when uh, you know there are the flash floods in some areas. And so that means that you may be cut off. There could be potential of uh, areas that have poor communication network or infrastructure. So these are risks that may influence your data collection in one way or another. And it's really good to put them there so that you kind of buffer yourself as a consultant. In case anything happens, you can always refer back to this because this is also uh, an important document that is almost like contractual, let me say, because this is what you've said that you're going to do and how you're going to do it, okay? So you have those risks and you can also put in mitigation measures, potential mitigation measures and have uh, ways to go about them. So for instance, you can say remote money, uh, remote um, evaluation. So you can do virtual interviews where you have issues of access, or you can say you will rely on documents, uh, desk reviews, maybe that could be having the similar information. Yeah, something like that. And then we talk about the data analysis approach that you're going to use for the evaluation. So you've already put, um, or rather, uh, you've already put in place, you know, the, 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 do the data collection tools that you're going to use. So you already know if it's both qualitative and quantitative. Uh, and then you already now think about, okay, if it's quantitative, maybe I'm going to have to use some software. Uh, do I have this software? If it's data, if it's SPSS, or if it's qualitative, are you going to still use another software or you're going to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, or use, you know, Microsoft Excel, which can also be used for qualitative um, data collection, I mean, data analysis. So that needs to be clear so that even the client understands your approach completely and there are minimal or if any questions on this then also to talk about the reporting which will go through the final report which is something that you can now present also in the inception report just as the structure and uh, you can talk about even the pages that you will have there that is sometimes also already guided by the client and lastly you need to put in like some tentative dates uh, for the deliverables. Uh, so most in most instances, when you have your preliminary meeting, the client will be very clear on when they need the final report. So from there, usually you just work backwards and you know how many days that you need for data collection, how many days you need for desk review, for data analysis. Then you just put in a small table with the dates and the deliverables. So whether it's the final report, uh, the draft report, 
um, if they need a presentation or a, a workshop for a validation workshop, you can put that in there. Right, so let's go to the final report now. So, so okay, let let me take you back a little bit and, and so that we can go systematically. So we started with the evaluation. We've talked about the evaluation. There was a terms of reference that was advertised and the client, I mean, the consultant applied for it, did a proposal, they won the award and they got the, uh, they did the preliminary meeting and then they did the inception report. After you do the inception report, you do your data collection. Then after the data collection, now you do your final report. Um, this process is ideally, you know, sometimes it's, uh, in theory, it can be very smooth, as I've just said, but sometimes it can have some delays, as we all understand, even in project implementation, there are always delays here and there. Uh, but, you know, as we've said, we have those dates that we've, uh, the deliverable dates that are there. Uh, and it's again good as a consultant, you need to put in some some buffer days. As much as you put in some days there, you may not work every single day. Let's say like uh, I'll put in five days for doing the final report. I may not actually work all those five, like continuous, let's say Monday to Friday. Those may be split in between two weeks, those five days. Okay, so it's really good to also put in some some adequate time in between there because there are also occasions of like uh, let's say uh, public holidays. There are also occasions where the consultant also has other work that they are doing simultaneously. But this is not something that you tell your client. You just need to make sure that you um, ensure yourself just in case anything happens, you can deliver on time. And even when you're working in a team it's really important to have those extra days because people work at different paces, uh, especially when you're in a team where you're not all together in the same office and you're not even working from the office. So that means that you need to, you know, just think about the other person as well. They, they have their own program, they have their other things that they're doing. Right, okay, so here we are, the final report is the final stage. I would say it's a final stage of the, of the evaluation process. Um, together with now the presentation, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's at the same time. So you'll do the report and maybe do the presentation or maybe do the presentation of the draft report. And then you can have now the final report, uh, final version of the final report as what is submitted to the client. So it's done at the end of the evaluation. Again, it's still done by the external consultant or the evaluator. Why it's important is it outlines the findings from the data collection and it helps the project team to make appropriate decisions. As I was saying earlier at the, at the start, I said, you know, ME is very important, but it can only be helpful if we take in the findings from what we, we get and then use them to adapt different projects or if it's the same project to be better. That's the only way it can be useful or important, you know? All these findings, it's evidence-based. We are getting feedback from the community, which is sometimes not done very consistently, especially through monitoring. You may not have as much time to actually have that detailed conversation with uh, different stakeholders. So evaluation, uh, report and findings, I feel are very, very important and need to be accorded that you know, important and disseminated as well and used effectively. So how do we do a final report? So the first draft um, is should be done approximately 10 days after completing the data collection. And you may ask why. Uh, in my experience, uh, let me say that usually when you're fresh from collecting the data, you can actually even write down a lot you know you can already analyze things you can understand uh where the project is really maybe the key constraints the gaps the effectiveness of the project so it will be so much easier for you to even note things down then uh, as you prolong that period you sometimes start to forget some key things that you got uh, you may have written down the notes but you know sometimes there are things which you may not have been able to write down immediately Sometimes even you've not recorded, 
and some things may be lost somewhere up in the air. Uh, that's one, one reason. And then two is also not to make this process as lengthy. Uh, it's just important to make sure there's some continuity, as we said, from the inception report, to the data collection to the final report. So just to make sure that there's that, you know, simultaneous um, continuation of, the, of this evaluation process. So this is also a, a time that is agreed upon between the client and the consultant. So this is just a recommendation, but you know it's 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 uh, the discretion of you and the client. So it depends on also you know the client may be having their own workshops, other internal activities that are going on, and they may tell you, oh you know we can give you fourteen days or we can give you twenty one days because we have these activities. Uh, sometimes even you know when you have like clients in Europe they may be actually closing office for you know their leave and and their holidays like summer holidays or you know etc so it it actually just depends on the client but you can actually do the draft yourself as a consultant you don't have to wait for that to go ahead and then just be ready to submit when they are ready to read it okay and then now the first draft is circulated to the project staff and then a presentation should be made for feedback to be sought. Uh, this is how it goes most of the time. Sometimes you don't have time to do the presentation face-to-face. Uh, -face. You may do it virtually. Sometimes you may just share the draft and then you wait for the feedback. But the presentation is really important. It helps to tie in a lot of things that may, may, may be misinterpreted uh, or maybe may not be very clear in your draft report. So sometimes you do actually a presentation of the preliminary findings before you, you actually do the draft report. And that serves the same purpose. It's just to make sure that we are the stakeholder knows the information that you've gotten and also can, can help you to align it better when you're doing your reporting. Um, then the other point is that analysis can be done on the go as data is coming in, especially for quantitative data where you know you usually just use servers and you can get uh like when you're using kobo uh you you just you can see and check the information as it's coming in and you can also even start with this uh quantitative surveys before you do your virtual interviews especially if you have a large sample size let's say when you're doing household surveys maybe you're targeting uh 500 or 200 that's quite a large number so you may start with this and then do the analysis as you as the data is coming in to also just understand what is the picture. This also helps you when you when you're doing your qualitative data collection. You can be able to ask some questions to probe on why certain responses are as they go as they come. I mean, uh, so for instance, maybe you're getting a lot of feedback on people saying that they have not had a meal in the last two days and yet some food distribution was done. So you can ask the project manager why, uh, you know, when was the last time that they did the food distribution to also ascertain that it's been done according to what was said in the plan. And, and then you also need to do data triangulation. So that means using various sources. I think I've just talked about that uh, when I talked about, you know, the desk review material. So you use that in, in, in conjunction with the primary data collection. So all the interviews, you just use them to also map the picture. They need to be speaking the same language. If not, then there's, there are queries that you need to either ask, clarify, or also just report them as part of your findings to say that some things are not as represented on the ground. Then just lastly, to ensure that you are including cross-cutting elements such as gender, age, environmental factors, etc. Uh, these are common things that right now in the um, in if you're working in any NGO space, you know, there's a lot of talk on even human rights, um, just making sure that we have all these approaches and we also have analysis like gender analysis uh, clearly indicated if there's any discrimination. Um, anything that they've not done according to you know the mandate of like mainstreaming, this needs to be included. Then uh, about the length, usually the final report is about 30 pages, but it can be longer and shorter again, depending on the client's needs. 
for the project's complexity. And for lengthy reports, it's good practice to also have a two-page briefer that is easily digestible. As I've said, I think twice or thrice before now, it's it's not important to only collect this information. What is important is to disseminate the information and make sure it's going to be adapted to the project or you know, future projects. Then lastly, let's talk about the structure of the report, of the final report. And as I said before, you will see it's very similar to the inception report. Uh, what will just change is the content and sometimes the, 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 the length of now each of these headings. So the title page is, I think, clear and straightforward. Uh, the executive summary here now will be longer. It can be two to even five pages sometimes uh, because some of these things, some of these um, projects you will need to have like the executive summary even having headings. So the executive summary may have headings of each of the deliverables and what was the key finding or even, uh, you know, you will use the, in the next slide, I'll just show you on the OECD criteria and you'll use that as part of your executive summary headings and have the summary as part of those headings. Then we'll have the table of contents and then we'll have introduction in the background, which is again, just similar to the inception report. This you can actually even pull from the inception report. You don't have to rewrite it again from scratch. We'll talk about now the methodology and the limitations. Remember the, in the other one, we, use, we wrote a risk matrix, but here we are writing a limitations, not the risk. We'll, we'll talk about now what has actually happened when we were at the data collection site. Any correspondence that we didn't get, maybe any people who we targeted but were not able to be included in the data collection for one reason or another. Then um, in the findings now, I was talking about the OECD criteria, which are these six key criteria, the relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, impact, sustainability, and coherence. I won't go through them in detail, but these are usually the common uh, universally used approaches in evaluation. So you can decide to use this format to put in your findings or you can use the evaluation objectives or questions. Again, it has to be just a, a conversation that you have with your client, or if the client just leaves it at your discretion as the consultant, you can use the best way forward. But this usually is very effective because it's very clear. You know, this, these settings are very clear and concise, and we have definitions in the uh, OECD website, which can also help you as a guidance. And then we have conclusions and recommendations uh, that should also be clear. They, they should be key bullet points of like recommendations or conclusions, and then you define them so, it, so that someone does not just have to read like a whole narrative paragraph, or you can indicate in bold what's the key things, uh, because sometimes someone doesn't have the time to read through the whole report. Maybe they'll just go to the conclusions and recommendations. So make sure it can it stands out. And then we have the references and appendixes, appendices where we indicate the terms of reference. We put in all the data collection tools, that's very important, and all other sources of information. So you can see that you also cited uh, information from the project documents and which project documents, whether it's the annual reports um, or the ME plan, everything that is there. And that's it. Um, thank you so much uh, for your attention. I think we can take some questions now. Thank you so much, uh, Winnie, for that presentation. And uh, we do have quite a number of questions. Um, I'm going to start with uh, from Britu, who asks, is evaluation undertaken at the end of the project? Uh, yes, so it can be undertaken at mid-term, so at the middle of the project and also at the final stage of the project. Those are the common, uh, the two common times that it's done. Okay, thank you. And just a follow-up question on the same from uh, Britu as well. At what stage uh, is monitoring then undertaken? Who will be monitoring it? So this is uh, other than evaluation. So this is the monitoring bit of it. 
Right. Okay, so monitoring is done continuously throughout the project life cycle. Monitoring is done internally in the organization, so by organization staff. Remember when I said evaluation is done by uh, the consultant, so that is external. Monitoring is done from the point of when you start your project implementation, monitoring should be done from then on. So you're the one to decide how often the monitoring activities are to be done. But as I said, it won't be as detailed as an evaluation. When you're monitoring, you're only checking that the activities have been done. Maybe you're just like verifying, uh, let's say if it was like food distribution, how many sacks have been uh, distributed. If maybe you're measuring um, how many people have been vaccinated, it's just like a checks and balances. But an evaluation is much more thorough where you talk to much more um, stakeholders, you cross check, you know, you triangulate, but monitoring, you don't have that time because that monitoring, you're checking either, it could be daily, weekly, monthly, but the activities are still going on. So it's also hard to have that, all that analysis and, and cross checking um, through different stakeholders. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, before I go to the next question, uh, we are going to take two, two or three questions uh, live. So if you'd like to ask your question on uh, the webinar online live, kindly uh, do raise your hand and we will allow you to speak um, briefly. So um, there's someone who asks, this is Ali, uh, wants to get some, uh, someone to help him in the clarification of inputs outputs and outcomes. So I think this is in regards to projects. Um, Winnie, I don't know if you can be able to take that in terms of uh, relating it to report writing. Okay. Um, I, I get where his question is coming in. So actually this is where, uh, okay, inputs are the first level at the, if you're familiar with a logical framework uh, or even results framework, more or less the same, so inputs are the, the base level. It's, it's where activities are done, basically. So inputs are things like, uh, let's say if it's training, so they're, they're, they're the things that you're going to use for the activities. So it could be it could be stuff, it could be things like the resources that you have, okay? So actually this level, the input level and the, the inputs um, and outputs are the the places where you undertake monitoring because that's the base level. Then, um, so, so inputs, uh, you know, those like, um, let me give now an, an entire example so that I can give it from input to outcome. So like a health project, an input can be vaccines. So the activity there is vaccination. Then the output is number of children vaccinated. So output is like the, that activity leads to what 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 is the um, kind of end product of, of, of the activity of the input so people are um, children are vaccinated and then the outcome is that you know this um, increased uh, apart from you know the vaccination you're also doing awareness so people know now about vaccination so it's increased awareness about vaccination that's an outcome so an outcome, uh, as I said, can be immediate, an immediate result or intermediate result. Sometimes it's not easy to measure an outcome in monitoring. It's actually not, um, not very easy unless it's a long-term project. So outcomes and, and uh, outcomes, yeah, let me say outcomes and sometimes also outputs are also what is measured at evaluation stage. Evaluation does not measure the input and activity level, it's, it's higher level. So output and uh, mostly outcome, but sometimes also output depending on maybe if their project delays, they could also measure the outputs that have been there. Oh, thank you so much. And I'd like to request uh, for Emily to prepare herself with a question um, who will be followed by Natuha, then uh, Mohammed. Uh, so in that order, kindly prepare yourselves. Uh, in the meantime, I think you can take another question. Uh, this is from Monica. 
uh, is it necessary for each project to do formative evaluation? And I think uh, we can combine this uh, because there is some definition there of formative evaluation. We can combine Monica's question and Abdul's question who also asks uh, what are different types of evaluation methodologies and what is the difference between evaluation types and methodologies? So those are two questions in one, Winnie. Yeah, thanks, Diana. And uh, thank you to all the participants for asking these very good questions. So um, let me start with the different types of evaluations. There, there are so many types, I won't be able to, to name them all. Uh, let me go with the one which um, was brought by Monica. Um, so she said formative. So when you talk about formative, there's formative and summative. Those ones are types of evaluation uh, by, by time. By time? But yes, by time. So usually there's by time or by approach or by, uh, there, there are various, there's so many, there are, I think almost even more than 10 types of evaluations. But what is important is for you to understand uh, the type of project that you're doing so that you understand the need, the, the need to do, I mean, you align it with which evaluation is most suitable. So formative evaluation, let me just capture that because that one has been asked, is done, uh, it's more like the baseline that I, I talked about sometimes that baseline or um, needs assessment. Uh, it's done at the beginning of before, uh, actually before a project is starts. So when you're, when you're, in the, when you're doing this, the whole point is, uh, as I said, you, you have to go through the whole steps, uh, but you may not be, you do not have any background information, you don't have any descriptive material, unless this project, this is like a continuation of a project. Uh, so, you know, sometimes that we have um, a, a project which has like a no cost extension, or maybe they're even extended with, uh, with some money, but maybe for like a shorter duration. But it's important to have that formative assessment to also check on what went well before that and what is actually the, the baseline so that we can have feasible targets that and also smart indicators. Um, so I hope that one is clear on formative. Uh, and then now the opposite of that one is summative, which is final evaluation that is done at the end of the project. That one is very common and it's usually very straightforward in that you know you're just checking for everything um, from the beginning what the project has done when we talk about um, the methodologies methodologies are not specific to evaluations methodologies are uh, just ways in which you can collect data so those are more general more broad um, i talked about interviews so key informant interviews we talk about uh, focus group discussions uh, surveys or questionnaires um, obs observations or you know checklists, um, uh, case studies. Yeah, those are those are the key ones that that had the the methodology. So it's methodology is just the approach, the method that you use to collect the data. So you can use the same methodologies even in monitoring. Only that again, as I said, you may not have the time to do all many types of uh, many use many tools and also interview or talk to many stakeholders in monetary. Thank you so much. And I believe that question also does answer uh, Robert Otieno's uh, question, as well as um, Makur's question. And I've seen a couple of questions here asking us to share uh, samples on reports. So we will be sharing that as well as the recording and the uh, slides that Winnie was able to share. Uh, right now, I'd like to bring on board uh, Emily. Uh, Emily, you can unmute yourself and ask uh, the questions. Uh, Emily, are you with us? And then after that, uh, we'll have uh, Natuha. And in the interest of time, kindly uh, prepare yourself with your question. Emily, followed by Natuha. Okay, we're not able to get Natuha, I mean, to get Emily. So can we get uh, Natuha? Who will be followed yes. by Mohammed. Yes, yes, Natuha, welcome on board. Thank you and good afternoon to all members. My concern is uh, a general concern that I have even had in other webinars and the seminars. It is about the evaluation criteria, like she said, that is generally accepted. 
And my concern is in most cases, once you look at the um, terms of references, some terms of references are not always specific on which criteria to follow, but they have got the evaluation questions, they have got the um, evaluation objectives, etc, etc. Now, under situations where the evaluation criteria is not provided, and they are, the, the, the terms of references are providing evaluation questions. Can't you respond to those evaluation questions and do the data collection and analysis and make your presentations and reports to the satisfaction of your clients? That is the first one. Another one is about um, you coming up with the, maybe the sixth or seventh or eighth criteria to add on what is already accepted globally. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, yes, you can totally do your report or your data collection using the evaluation questions. Uh, it's actually, for me, I find it a little bit easier because it's also more concise when you have the evaluation questions because they are more defined. So you will find that these evaluation questions in some way, they actually speak to this criteria in one way or another. They might not use the same terminology, so they might not exclusively write, this is effectiveness, this is efficiency. But when you understand the questions, they fall under this specific criteria. In addition, you can have the conversation with your client, uh, I mean, the client, between the client and the, and the consultant, and you can propose that you will collect the data according to evaluation questions, but you will do your report according to the OECD criteria, if that is what you want to do, or you just agree on the format. Then your second question is on adding uh, criteria. So you cannot add a criteria. This uh, it's it's an organization uh, which formed this. So it is it's it's uh, it was formed through consultation of various uh, stakeholders of humanitarian development background. And they feel that this is sufficient to cover everything that is needed in an evaluation. So maybe what the addition that you can have is not necessarily a criteria, but uh, you know an add-on to the specific, according to the specific project. So I think as I was talking about contextualization, so you may find like something that is really important that still needs to be put in as a key finding, which is fine. It may not necessarily, um, which I don't know, it's rare, unless maybe you give a detailed example, but we can talk about this um, in another forum, maybe on, on what exactly could not lie into in those criteria, because like coherence is something that was added more recently, the last criteria that I mentioned there, it was added in, I think it was 2019. 2019 around there. But yes. my biggest concern actually, I'm even having a discussion with some stakeholders about mm -hmm. the, the adding on the criteria. I'm not opposed to what is already there, but I feel they address the concerns of either the development partners or implementing organizations as opposed to the beneficiaries, the beneficiary communities. And I'm looking at that criteria that looks at the integrating the understanding and of the beneficiaries and merging it with the understanding of the development partners. And then it also adds up on the existing options in that criteria. And I think if all goes well, very soon it will come up because we are just, uh, we have already started the process. So anytime mm -hmm. soon you will expect it. And as I was proposing that I need also to take part in those, in some of your sessions, is one way of trying to, to explain that case. So that as maybe one day somehow consults you, you have an idea. Okay. Thank you, otherwise. Um, okay, thank you, Natwa. Thank you so much. Um, I did ask uh, Hilary, followed by Ibrahim. Uh, Hilary, you can ask your question. And in the interest of time, uh, a lot of our questions, we've sent in a lot of our questions. So these questions are actually 
part of our course that uh, we were able to share with you. You can be able to see them, uh, you can be able to understand, get more in-depth uh, analysis on uh, report writing and proposal writing. And uh, we also do have other courses that do link to this. Uh, statistical analysis is quite important when it comes uh, to report writing. And so is, uh, like I said, data analysis and visualization, okay? You, they do help you generate your uh, reports. And uh, we do have various detailed uh, courses and using SPSS, Stata, uh, R for Statistics, Power BI, Tableau, and among others. So feel free to reach out to us and we'll be able to add you to those courses. Uh, so Hilary, kindly, uh, this is our final question for the day. The questions that you have asked are available in our trainings and we'll be able to uh, shed more light when you're part of our training on uh, report writing and propose, report and proposal writing. Uh, Hilary, over to you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, great presentation. So my question was just, as now most MAE is, is more participatory and you talk about sharing the final draft, I mean, report with office staff. Is it important to also share this report with community stakeholders that participated in the uh, data collection process? Yes, Hilary, uh, thank you so much for your question. And yes, definitely, you, um, as I said, there's no point of doing this report if you don't disseminate it, if you don't digest it. Um, and apologies, I didn't touch on what you just said. We, we may not present the report as is to the beneficiaries or the community stakeholders, but what you can do is do some other versions of the report. So, um, you know, you can, you can have, things that are maybe more visual, um, depending on the community of case, you, you, you look at the literacy rates, the, the you know, what, what can be actually accepted and used by the community and use that format. So whether it's even in the form of like an article or a blog can be put on social media to see what has been the findings of this project, because you know, communication is really important and information is, is power. And the other thing is also it can be verbally disseminated once it's approved. That is now after um, the, the, at the project, when you're talking with the project staff, uh, let me also just emphasize this part is where you, they are also contributing more to at this draft stage of the report. But once it is finalized and it's approved by the client, then you can take it to the community level. Because sometimes it's, it can be very lengthy if you're taking it to the community before it's um, finally approved, getting to all the stakeholders is quite a task. Um, but the importance is just to incorporate, make sure you've incorporated all those voices that you've got and triangulate them. And then make sure when you're disseminating, it's also still anonymous. You don't like, write like, oh, the community elder said this, and this, no, it should still be confidential, but they should just understand what have been the general findings and the conclusions and the recommendations are really, really important because that's also helps them, empowers them to know how they can support themselves or what to expect if anything is going to come of it. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that question. And at this point, I'd like to thank all our participants, especially those of us who've been very interactive in the chat section, in the Q&A section. Uh, I believe we've been able to respond to most of your questions and most of your chat. Uh, if not, we're still continuing as we close up, as we close uh, this uh, webinar, we are still continuing with answering. Uh, I'd also like to thank generally the participants who take time to attend all our other webinars. As we've mentioned, we have a webinar every Wednesday between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. Uh, East African time. That is the time in Nairobi. Uh, Central African time would be uh, 10 a.m. to 11 uh, a.m. And then West African time is uh, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, I'd also like to thank Humanitarian Global Team for having hosted and uh, having facilitated this webinar. Uh, we do appreciate the team that works very hard behind the scenes to facilitate this and make this webinars possible. Finally, I want to appreciate our expert for the day, Winnie Moir, I believe who's been able to impact uh, knowledge and skills on report writing and proposal writing. 
If you'd like to learn more about us, kindly go to our website. Uh, you can always click on request a call back and we'll be able to reach out to you. Uh, with that said, I do wish you a great rest of the day and uh, hopefully we meet next Wednesday for our next webinar. Goodbye.